Of course, it's fitting that uh, we should have so many people from different parts of campus here and that we are actually in a different part of campus because that's, uh, that's what Bill is, is all about. Bill is a recognized thought leader, designer, advisor, and author. He was trained as an architect and his interests, influence, um, interest and influence range widely. He works uh, from the scale of global to molecular. Time Magazine has called him a hero for the planet, noting that his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that is demonstrable and in practical ways and is changing the design of the world. In 2002, Bell McDonough and Browngart co-authored Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, which is widely acknowledged as a seminal text of the sustainability movement. And for those of you who are in the um, CSR and sustainability class over at Haas, I do believe we, we covered it on Monday, right? I'm getting nods, good. Um, McDonough advises commercial and governmental leaders worldwide through McDonough Advisors. He is active with William McDonough and Partners, his architecture practice, as well as McDonough Browngart Design Chemistry, the cradle to cradle consulting firm. He and Browngart also co founded the not for profit organizations to allow public accessibility to cradle to cradle thinking, including the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. McDonough also co-founded Make It Right with Brad Pitt to bring affordable cradle-to-cradle -cradle inspired homes to New Orleans. I know you're not here to, to hear me speak, so I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Thank you so much for being here. Bill McDonough. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here at, at Berkeley. Um, uh, you may have heard recently Stanford announced that they're going to be getting my archives and I'm going to be the first living archive at Stanford. And the idea that you know, I would come to the Bay Area regularly is not an unusual one because between places like Berkeley, Stanford, the clients we have here in my little studio here, um, I have the great privilege of being here. I consider this to be one of those places on the earth that is defining the future that we wish to see. And as a designer, I see design as the first signal of human intention. And I look at the world uh, through uh, a notion that we have an emptiness now that we need to fill and understand. And that emptiness is our hope. And we see a world of limits. We see a world of, of desperation. We see a world that's being quietly degenerated by various activities of humans as the dominant species. And it's time for us to take stock of the tragedy that we see occurring around the world and realize that if we allow this tragedy to persist, we might as well consider it intentional. Because if we say it's not our plan to destroy the planet, it appears to be our de facto plan because it appears we have no other plan. So what is the plan? Well, what if things got better as we went around instead of worse? Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't that give some hope to the kids? So today I'm going to talk about the upcycle, the new book I've written with Dr. Michael Browngart. And the upcycle is about the world getting better because we're here. And it sounds simple. It's not. But it kind of is. For children, they hear it and they go, that's a good idea. So how do we go about this? Cradle to Cradle, which was published in 2002, is like the fulcrum for Archimedes' famous statement, give me a lever, a fulcrum, and a place to stand and I could move the earth. A famous newspaper recently misquoted it as give me a lever and a place to stand and I could move the earth. Without a thing that does not move, all you can do is poke holes in things. So, the question becomes, what is the foundation, what is the bedrock of our value system that allows us to create protocols so we can have actions based on those values? So the values that I like to use in my work are a fundamental question. How do we love all the children of all species for all time? If we start with that and then move to our principles, we can set goals, strategies, tactics, and metrics. If we start with metrics, we benchmark. 
why would we benchmark what we do now? All we can do from there is get to goals and we haven't changed things. So what is the upcycle? The upcycle is building on cradle to cradle as its fulcrum. And it's a story of evocative levers. It's just a story about the last 10 years, what we've discovered. And it's a, there to inspire your own thinking, we hope, or just get you speculating or imagining things another way. And as Leibniz famously said, if it is possible, therefore it exists. And does that mean it's easy? No. And there are some of us whose job it is to make it exist so that others realize it's possible if they're having trouble with that idea. And, and think of the moonshot, because really think of the upcycle as kind of an essay of clues about an earth shot. And this will be more germane when I show you our new space station for NASA, which is just down the road. It's on Earth. Think of this as an earth shot. And when we said we're going to the moon, did we know how we were going to do it? No. What did we know? We were going to the moon. That's what we knew. And when you ask, or we heard Buzz Aldrin when he came back from the first moonshot, landing on the moon, he came back and he, they said, well, Commander Aldrin, how often were you on course to the moon? And he said, we were never on course to the moon, but we could see it. So we need to see it, and then we move toward it. So you are the ones who will define what we see. So our goal is quite simple, and it's positive. The goal of the upcycle is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. Period. Now notice this doesn't say less unsafe, less unhealthy, less unjust. So if we're going to talk about corporate social responsibility, things like that, it's amazing to me, as I will point out, that I'm in wonderment that we all talk about goals of zero. Why would we have goals of zero? Is it better if we're not here? Is that all we have? Hey, kids. Zero. Get up today and disappear, please. Think about it. So we're going to look at that for a minute. So it requires us, I think, to, somebody the other day said, Bill is a person who turns things upside down. I said, no, I don't see myself like that. I try to turn things right side up. <laughs> it seems to me that we are looking at a group of people here in this room that we could call the regenerates. <laughs> because most people look like degenerates to me, if you look at their behaviors. If they're going for zero, it's because, guess what, they're degenerative. Why would we want less of them? There's a reason, and they're proud of it. I think it's upside down. So let's th start over again. So let's get to the beginnings of things. This is a poem from the early 1100s, first decade of the 1100s from Hildegard von Bingen. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's greenings, now think. That is what this talk is about. So Michael Braungart and I met in 1991. This is us at the Earth Summit, looking at a sewage treatment plant that used plants and fish in a village there that's still thriving to this day. And at the Earth Summit, afterwards, Maurice Strong, Morris Strong, the, the secretary of the Earth Summit, was asked how many world leaders were here. And his answer was, I think, we had 124 heads of state, but no leaders. And if we look at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which, um, or the Business Council for Sustainable Development, which matured into the, the World Business Council a few years later, they coined this term and published it. The concept of eco-efficiency refers to creating more value with less impact, less impact. Companies committed to eco-efficiency endeavor to produce goods and services using fewer resources and generating less waste and pollution. They make money. Okay. Less waste and pollution. In other words, we're accepting the concept of pollution. We're just doing less of it. Fair enough. 
a nice thing to talk about doing. Fair play to you. Now, at the same time, I had written the Hanover Principles for the World's Fair for the year 2000. It was a gift of the German government at the Rio Earth Summit. And you'll notice just here, I want to point out one of them. So, that, uh, well, actually, I'll just put them out quickly. Insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist. Recognize interdependence. Rela respect the relationships between spirit and matter. Accept responsibility for the consequence of design. Create safe objects of long-term value. Eliminate the concept of waste. This does not say reduce waste. This says eliminate the entire concept. Rely on natural energy flows. Be humble and see constant improvement, which is why we're here. Now, when we put these out, we, we thought of three design principles that we use. One was waste equals food. Second was use current solar income. And third was respect diversity. And we have upcycled this, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute in the new book, and I'll explain why. But in Cradle to Cradle, we talked about the idea that there were two metabolisms in the world. One was the natural metabolism of, bio of the biology and biological things, and these are products we would consider that are biological nutrients. These are things meant to be designed to go back safely to soil or they come into hot contact with humans and skin, you might breathe them and so on. On the other hand, in the last 5,000 years, we've also developed another metabolism, the one that we call the technical metabolism, the metabolism of these things and metals, plastics, so on. And these we see wanting to go back into cycles just like the biological system. So first thing Cradle to Cradle did was put into the world the idea there are two metabolisms. Right? We also looked at efficiency versus well, effectiveness. And Peter Drucker, the famous management consultant, in his book, The Effective Executive from 1984, on page one says, it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. But it's the executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. And when we think about that, that means that efficiency is really simply a tool. And it has no value per se. Because is efficiency a good or a bad? It's like another tool. Any tool's value is set by the intention to which the human puts it. A hammer is not a good or a bad. It doesn't know. If I hit you with it, it's a weapon. If I build you a house with it, it's a benefit. The hammer doesn't know. Efficiency doesn't know. What if you're a terrorist and you're efficient? You're worse, you see? So efficiency per se is not a good. Effectiveness, on the other hand, is a reflective, uh, reflects values. What is the right thing to do? And for an executive, their job is to create value and revenue for enterprise, you see. So if you're making the wrong product that the market doesn't want and you're doing it very efficiently, huh, oops, right? In a market looking for Priuses and you make Hummers, oops, okay? So the right thing to do is important, but also the right thing to do by society, et cetera, et cetera. Then we give it to the managers. So we want to be efficient, but after we're being effective. So that's important because being less bad is not being good. It is amazing to me how many people in society look and see less bad as two numbers. They get multiplied together into negative numbers. They get multiplied into a positive. Double negatives, you know, what is that? Double negatives are positives, right? Oops. Bad is a human value. Less is a relationship. Less bad is bad, just less so. Right? So by definition, you're bad, you're just less so. Oh, and your goal is zero because you want to be less bad. Is that good? Huh? It's time to call this for what it is. And at the same time, society likes to regulate when it's afraid because it has to. But a regulation is actually a signal of design failure. This is a talk about design. These doors need to be redesigned, for example. <laughs> I'm serious. How could anyone design a classroom with doors that sound like that? Right? This is the noise of bad design right there. It's probably a very efficient door. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's also very ineffective as a door for a classroom. So we would regulate that door and give it a decibel level on opening and closing because we're, we don't like it. You see? Now, regulation is a signal of design failure. There's one. And so the question becomes, 
If I design things that are safe and healthy, society has nothing to worry about. It doesn't regulate it. Hello, business. You don't like regulation? Why? It's a cost. Okay. Face it. Society is trying to send you a signal. There's something wrong. Fair enough. So design things that don't require regulation. Fair enough, you see. What is your intention? Poison people? Less slowly? Fight with lawyers? How about just redesign it? Let's get on with it. So, if we look at the history of environmental legislation in the United States, take a look at this. No wonder business is nervous. This is a signal of design failure on the part of commerce. And these regulations aren't that effective. Tosca legislation has not really changed the chemistry universe as much as one might have hoped all, after all these years. Because people are fighting it out. So if design is the first signal of human intention, you wake up in the morning, you have designs on the world, then what's next? Well, I, have to, I like to say what's next is what's next. I was at a conference of textile, uh, the largest apparel maker in the world and uh, company, and uh, they had 150 textile people coming to show their new textiles, and I had to close it. It was fun, and I said to all these 150 companies, so what's next for your product? Nobody had an answer. All they could answer was, next year I'm bringing, you know, a clothing that gives you sends emotional signals to someone talking to you. Like if you're feeling good, it turns red. And we had a stem cell clothing that can grow on your skin. And like, whoa. And, but the question was, what's next for what you just showed us? I don't want to hear what you're doing next year. I want to know what happens. The thing you just told us was so great. Not one of those products was safe. Not one. Not one knew what would happen next. Not one knew where it was going or that it could become a nutrient for any other system. It had nowhere to go but being toxic waste. Nowhere to go. And most of them did not belong next to human skin. Okay? What a crazy world. Sure we want zero. So the companies that say we want to be zero, be very careful because they're probably right. We probably do want them to be zero. We probably want them to go away. Right? But away has gone away, so we have to honor that and do the transformations. So when we wrote the upcycle, we realized that waste equals food. We, we, we don't want to use the word waste. As Michael likes to say, if I say don't think of a pink elephant, you can't help it. So if you use the word waste, then you think waste. So we get rid of the word waste. Right? If you hear waste, yourself saying waste, just stop yourself like Dr. Strangelove. Say, waste. <laughs> right? No, you say nutrient. And watch what happens. Right? Secondly, by saying everything is food, we can say it's food for biology, it's food for technology, and it's food for thought. Because right? we need creativity. Now, use clean energy, because we're seeing new forms of energy that aren't necessarily solar, that are clean and very exciting. So use clean energy. That doesn't mean carbon in the atmosphere, for sure. And celebrate diversity. We used to say respect diversity, and the reason we say celebrate, I don't know how many of you have watched the decline of the monarch butterfly, but recently it was announced that the habitat in Mexico in, for the winter has declined from 20 some odd acres uh, 20 years ago to 2.9 acres this year. 2.9 acres. There's logging still going on. There are pictures of logging trucks taking out trees covered with monarch butterflies. Can you imagine that? And we've gone from 20 some odd acres down to 2.9. There are 900,000 children in the United States tracking the flights of the monarchs, the migrations north on an app created by the Annenberg Foundation. 900,000 children tracking the monarchs flying north. They won't be able to do this very long because there won't be any more of them. And what are the reasons? Well, drought. But think about it. Something like 90% of the soybean crop and 84, I think, percent of the corn crop in America now is Roundup ready from Monsanto. And with Roundup herbicides, we don't have milkweed in the soybeans anymore. Food for monarchs. So if our intention is to destroy the butterflies, really? But is an unintended consequence of other behaviors, we really want to look at whole system thinking and start asking ourselves, how would we celebrate the biodiversity? Because if we just respect the diversity, we can stand respectfully over the grave of the monarch butterfly and watch the diversity leave us and we can be respectful. But is that a happy message for the children? 
So, no, we say celebrate, so we move into it. So that's what the up cycle's about. It's a celebration of abundance. And so, like I pointed out, it's the bedrock of, for the lever of our communities. And so, it's a series of evocations and a kind of a tone poem that starts by just asking a simple question, how do we think about this afresh? Now, if we look at the history that we're working with here, we can go to the 1700s, and I've come here from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I had the privilege of living in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. And when you look at Jefferson as a designer, you see that in the 1700s, we start to see this idea of rights showing up, natural rights, human rights, coming out of the Enlightenment and the Western tradition. He read Anglo-Saxon, so he was looking at Magna Carta. But the Declaration of Independence was a nice beginning, but it applied to 6% of the population. It was white, landowning, Protestant males, but it's a start. And then as we get to suffrage and then the Endangered Species Act, we see this idea of rights expanding to even include nature itself, which is an interesting idea. But if we go to the 1800s then, when, it, when after Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations for all you business school students, after the Wealth of Nations, 1776, we have the 1800s and the market economies come. So between the idea of rights and the market economy, we see the destruction of feudalism. And then we see humans adopting you know, various kinds of social and economic protocols for the market economy, including communism, capitalism, and so on. And then at the end of the 1800s, we see the discovery of carbon fuels. Now, if we go to 1836 to take a tone poem on the ecological reference of the mindset during this time, this is Emerson at Harvard in, in 1836. And he was asked to write an essay on nature. What is nature? And he, he concluded that nature is all those things essentially immutable, too big for humans to affect. And his examples were space, the air, the river, the leaf. So much for the 19th century. So, we can affect all of these. We can take down mountains. We can affect the entire planet. We can acidify the oceans. We can change the climate. We can do all kinds of stuff. So what do you mean? It's the stuff we can't change. Guess what? This is the Anthropocene era. It is now considered almost a geological era, the one that is affected by humans. Think about it. The changes in the world we see are affected by humans. So I'd like to take on the energy problem, because in Cradle to Cradle we talked about materials, because there are a lot of people talking about energy. So we focus a little bit on this here and do some evocations. But see, we don't have an energy problem. And people say, oh, we have an energy problem. We've got to burn all this fuel, you know, because we have an energy problem. We don't have an energy problem. We have lots of energy. We have a material problem. Carbon. A wonderful material, in fact. You're mostly made of carbon. Anybody here not like carbon? All right, so why are we so obsessed about carbon? Zero carbon, hello? If you want to be zero carbon, shoot yourself, dry up, blow away. There it is, you are carbon. So carbon, oh, in this context, it's human use of carbon, I see. Well, a material in the wrong place is a toxin. Lead in a child's mouth is a neurotoxin. Lead in this computer is a solder, and it never leaves the technosphere because I recycle the computer and I never let that material get back to the biosphere at all. It's a technical nutrient. The lead doesn't know. It's like the hammer. How many of you think lead's a bad? Breach legislation in Europe says it's bad. Get it out of all computers. And then what happened? They used bismuth. Bismuth is mined with lead, 10 to 1. So just because we said no lead, we end up mining 10 times as much to get the bismuth, which is brittle and starts fires. So the airplanes won't use it. I don't want them using it either. Brittle, starts fires, in a big vibrating thing at 40,000 feet? I don't think so. So the idea you just say not something, but you don't say what. So if you just want to be zero, hmm. I mean, that's like I jump into a taxi when I leave here and I say, I'm not going to the airport. Does that help the cab driver? <laughs> you're saying what you're not. It's amazing. Or it's almost insane, really. It would be like going to a store and seeing a jar of brown stuff and it says, not peanut butter. So we have a material problem. So if we're just going to talk about carbon reduction, well, this is an ad by an automotive company. Look at that. AIM, zero emissions. 
got a picture of a tree. Can somebody explain the science of this? <coughs> uh, trees emit oxygen, thank God, right? I mean, zero emissions. There are emissions everywhere. I see zero emissions cars go by. It's like, really? You know, those tires are not abrading? Really? Let's do some science. Wouldn't it be great if that tire dust was actually nutrients for worms? Hmm. Instead of some air pollutant. See? All of a sudden, your mind's there. Everything's a nutrient. And we emit. Face it. Trees emit cherry blossoms in the spring. Anybody got a problem with that? Not very efficient. Thousands of blossoms, just in case we get two more cherry trees out of the deal. But hey, we love cherry trees. Beautiful. And they return to the soil and become cherry trees again. So we got a problem with this? So let's celebrate the abundance of good emissions. So most of the CSR reporting, and for the program here, I just would love to throw the stake in the ground and let's run around this maypole. Okay? They all talk about, oh, we're reducing our emissions by 20%, you know, by 2020. Oh, you're not, you're going to zero. Big companies have programs called their zero whatever programs, you know. Them. We even had one person talk about his climbing his mountain of zero. I mean, huh? It's, I don't know. Carbon is our friend. We love carbon, okay? So don't tell us what we're not, because I don't know what to do with that. Or we have free of. I love that one, too. So here's plutonium-free peanut butter. How exciting. So now you're telling me what you're not. Really? Hmm. So why don't we take this stuff that we consider bad, and why are we putting it in our businesses here? These are their business reports. I don't get it. They put this above the line. I guess it's the manager's job. Who's going to talk about what is good? So we take all the stuff we don't want, put it below the line in the bad section. Fine. So if we have carbon in the atmosphere, is a bad, we'll just reduce it. Yay! Let's go to zero. It's upward and to the right. That is the job of growth. That is the job of executives. Up and to the right. See? How many business people here like down to the right? Huh? Oh, you're not from the accounting department. See? For if you're into accounting for expenses, you might want to go down to the right. Fine. But that means you're managing something. You're a bottom line person. We're talking about top line generating revenue. That's the job of business. Then the managers can manage so there's some profit left over. Fine. But if you don't generate the revenue, you're out of business. So, we've proposed in the upcycle, we change our charts to look like this. Now you can chart your progress. Out with the bad air, in with the good. How much fun is that? So now your target could be like that for Google or Walmart, 100% renewably powered. Go for it! And watch the people in the company get excited. So for the Cradle to Cradle certification program and our protocols, we created this chart. And basically when we look at a product, we look on the left side, it's an undefined universe. You've got all kinds of stuff, chemicals you've never even heard of in there. So the first thing you do is your inventory. So we could take, you know, we could take Berkeley's Haas School and you could say these are all the departments and these are all the students or whatever and some of them are green and some of them are undefined and some of them are this and whatever. We do our inventory and we go, oh, great, accounting, things like that, you know, marketing, things like that, whatever. Everybody, let's get together and see who we are and what we're thinking. Then we put our values on it to do an assessment. Now with Cradle to Cradle products, we say something simple like, I don't think we should have any materials in here that accrue in human mother's milk to deleterious effect. There are 2,500 chemicals now accruing in human mother's milk that no mother I know asked for. It's actually a form of chemical harassment. And when you think about it, it's a good thing the baby's livers don't work for nine months because the mothers can breastfeed, blessedly. So they can bond with the child. But after nine months, when the livers kick in, the, the toxins will accrue in the baby. But in the first nine months, it's actually quite ironically and sadly beautiful that the baby is detoxing the mother because they're passing it through. Isn't that something? But is that the plan? Toxify our mothers? Really? So, after we've reviewed all the materials that go into a product, and we have to get the secrets to do this. And we get them. Because executives want to do the right thing. We don't, you know, I have never, well, only once. I, found, I had one CEO, I had one CEO. She was very famously the CEO of a toy company. 
making a, a doll that's head was PVC, but anyway. Um, but only once have I had an executive say to me, when we went in and you know, explained this, and they, they would say, they can't do this, say, give it to me, toxic. Only one person, and she's no longer there. Anyway, the point is, nobody would say that. Everybody has a mother. I said to an executive in the textile world the other day, let me see if you understand something. Your products that you're selling in the world, if your daughter wears the, that clothing, she's accruing these chemicals in her mother's milk. Is that what you're doing for your grandchildren with your products? Are you intending to give your daughter endocrine disruptors, carcinogens, mutagens, teratogens to wear around? Is that the plan? Because that's what's happening. And if that's what's happening, why don't you just say it out loud? You know how hard it is to say that? I'm here to toxify the children. Is that, are you ready to say that? Because in a lot of these businesses, that's what you do. Right? Let's just say it. Let's just say it and get on with our life. So this idea that we have this huge negative footprint, we all talk about reducing our ecological footprint, that's all very nice. Good idea. Is it sufficient? I don't think so. Sufficiency would be if we have lots of little footprints and they're all beneficial. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay. So that's what I want to talk about. So if we look at the planet and think like Hildegard pointed out, I was born in Tokyo, Japan in 1951. I saw Hiroshima as a child. And I always had this curiosity of why would people blow each other off the face of the planet? And then I had the other curiosity, how could they blow each other off? I mean, how could you make a city disappear in seconds? Isn't that something? And so, when I got to Dartmouth for undergraduate, I was an art student, and uh, I asked the prof physics professor, you know, I need to know how Hiroshima disappeared. He said, well, I don't think you're prepared for this. It's the special theory of relativity. I said, I know I'm not prepared, but I pay tuition, so let's give it a shot. <laughs> and, and so he said, here's the book, take it and read it. And I looked at E equals MC squared and said, I can't do this. And I'm at Dartmouth in 1970, before the energy crisis. We have a fire burning in the fireplace in our dorm room. It's a nice place. And in, Ver in New Hampshire, you know, trees are weeds. So I'm looking at the fire and I'm going like, oh, there's entropy. We studied that. Oh, but it's all going to chaos and everything just dissipates in the atmosphere. And we can never recover from this. It'll never re-aggregate. It's just chaos. Everything goes to chaos and that's it. Never to return. That's all we got? I'm from Asia. Where's, where's the opposite? There must be negative entry. So I went to the library, obviously pre-Google, and <coughs> I started looking for negative entropy in the physics section. I couldn't find it. I got back, I was very upset. So I couldn't do this formula and I couldn't figure out negative entropy. So there's a reason I'm in college. So as I was staring at the fire, all of a sudden I realized what is negative entropy? And the reason I hadn't found it, it's not in physics, it's biology. At disaggregated leaves on a tree absorb carbon from the atmosphere, collect minerals from the earth, and combine with water, create living things that aggregate into soil and create tree trunks which were burning. The log was negative entropy, obviously. They're connected. And then it occurred to me, as an art student, not as a scientist, this will be clear, I wanted to know how Hiroshima disappeared and why Einstein was afraid. So there it was, you see. E is like physics, M is chemistry, so the sun is E, for my purposes, as a designer, the earth is mass. We have 10,000 times roughly, we think, you know, more energy than we need to operate, so we have income. The only form of income on the planet is solar energy. That's interesting. We have occasional mass income with a meteorite and some cosmic dust, but nothing to speak of. And it's not raining phosphate or copper, I can assure you. So the question became, well, if we use the energy from the sun, a nuclear reactor in a very safe place, 93 million miles away, it's eight minutes and it's wireless. Hey, let's get on with it. And then we've got chemistry, and we have to preserve the mass and the quality of the mass, because if we take all the chromium out of South Africa and we put it in little products and distribute it in holes around the world and toxify the whole place, future generations will go, what were you thinking? Or not. You've lost all the value of these essential materials, and you've used them to toxify. Is that it? And then 
we can look at biology because Crick, for nine years after discovering DNA with James Watson, asked himself, what does it mean to be a living thing? And his conclusion was, in order to be alive, you have to have growth. Interesting, growth. Good for business. You have to have income. Hello? Anybody in business? You have to have income to grow your business, right? You have to have income for growth. Oh, and planetary income from the sun. Think about it. Where's a tree? You get its income, right? And then you have to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organisms and their reproduction. Cradle to cradle. Bingo. And then I realized how Hiroshima disappeared. Has anybody done the formula, the math here? Wow, this is cool. This is fun. I'm in a university. Anybody here do math? <laughs> Let's do math. Ready? Where's the number? C. Okay. C is a very big number. I'm an art student, right? 186,000 miles per second. In case that's not big enough, let's square it. All right. So, for my little brain, that is approaching infinity, as far as I'm concerned. That's bigger than I can imagine. All right. Which means that if M is in any way a positive number, how about one hydrogen atom? Then guess what E is? Bigger than you can imagine. Goodbye, Hiroshima. That is the atom bomb. Isn't that something? So, I get it. The mass matters even in its molecule, one molecule. That's why we look at things down to the parts per million, parts per billion. And the energy matters and it wants to come from the sun. And biology matters because it's the thing missing. We don't even have a letter for it. Right? You don't go E, M, B. Anybody seen B lately? Okay. So all of a sudden we realize the carbon comes from the atmosphere with the solar energy, the water, the minerals, and it gets put in soil. And that's the idea. That's the design for millions and millions and millions of years. Carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. I got it. And we come along in the last 200 years, and what do we do? It's party time. Send it all back up there. It's upside down. See? Carbon has been turned into a toxin. A toxin is a material in the wrong place. The intention of a tool is what creates its value. So the question is, don't our values including love for our children? How can a corporate executive clothe his daughter in toxins and think that's responsible business? And if all they talk about is, well, we're reducing our whatevers, you know? That's it. So Houston, we got a problem, all right. But we might have a solution, too, because I was asked to work on the Mars station. And uh, I'll show you what we did. We asked the question, Houston, do you have a solution? And so when you have a problem, what do you do? You have a need, you have imagination, you have materials. Paul McCready did the first human-powered flight because he needed $100,000 because his brother lost it in an investment. And there was a prize, 100,000 pounds, the Kramer Prize. And, and so he won it. And he had to imagine he'd never seen an airplane before. And he had to use any material at hand to achieve his end. So when NASA asked me to work on the Mars station, I said, I don't think I can do that, because why are you going to the red planet when you haven't come back to the blue one yet? Let's come back. If you can do this moonshot, can we do an Earth shot, please? Let's build a space station on Earth. So we went to Houston, and we went into this room, and I got to stand right where Gene Kranz was. It was so much fun. And we had all the designers from the International Space Station. And I said, OK. What's this about? Energy. Oh, it's a nuclear-powered thing. The reactor's 93 million miles away. It's eight minutes, and it's wireless. Thank you very much. You're in charge of energy. All right, what about the water? It's $80,000 to get a gallon of water up here. All right. Who's in charge of water? Are we drinking everything here? You got it. All right. Forward osmosis? You're in charge. Next. All right. So we designed it on Earth. We pretended we all came down naked, and we're standing around going, nice planet. Very hospitable. So where does the energy come from? Oh, why don't we dig for coal? Nah, we're in, we're in Mountain View. Don't see any coal here. Oh, uh, should we build a nuclear plant? Ah, kind of expensive, dangerous. Don't think so. Hmm, there it is. Reactor comes up here every day. All right, we'll do that. 
Got it? Now, what about the water, etc.? Anyway, we built it. Here it is. It's the first space station on Earth. It was built on a normal federal budget for an office building. The building has potential to produce 120% of the energy it needs to operate from renewable sources and purifies its own water. And it was done with a normal budget for an office building. It exists, therefore, it is possible. A building like a tree. You see, for 5,000 years, we've been banging stuff and making things, and we think we're really smart. But you gotta stop and reflect. It took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> we're not that smart. So, after 5,000 years of technical improvements, how about a building like a tree? A building that makes oxygen, sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, provides habitat for hundreds of species, crude solar energy is fuel, makes food, complex sugars, creates microclimates. Why not? When you look at lead building and it talks about 10% less carbon and gets highly ranked, and it used to be you got points for recycled content and you'd be recycling PVC carpets that are toxic and getting points. Really? We can do so much more. We can upcycle design. And the way we do that is we get out of this game of simply looking at measurements because all you can do is get to quantifications. And what we look at is we do our values and we start at the top. What do we love? How do we deal with it? What do we do? So we designed fabrics that are safe enough to eat. I did this in 1993. It's my first project with Michael. I brought in, we brought in the chemists, we looked at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industry, eliminated 7,962. We made a fabric so safe you can eat it, reduced its cost by 20%. The trimming, was, which had been declared hazardous waste, is now mulch for the local garden club. Why not? Cheaper, more profit. It's been selected by the Airbus 380 as the fabric of choice, which is very good news for your frequent flyers. As the food gets worse, if you have a supreme a very severe fiber deficiency, you can safely eat your chair. <laughs> okay. So we look at all the chemicals and we rate them and we rank them and we talk about constant improvement and we look at things that are disassembled like the steel case chair that comes apart in five minutes with tools you'd find in the kitchen drawer. So if it ends up in Mexico City out the back door 15 years from now, taken apart for aluminum, polycarbonate, polyester, steel, and so on. <coughs> We can also upcycle energy. I'm working on a Baltic island off Denmark. You know, we started to think, well, there's dark six months a year, so how do we feed them with solar energy in the winter? And we realized we have all this wind power at night. It comes in at 2 o'clock in the morning, and we have it all winter long. It's amazing, fierce gales, and we can use it to grow food because we've now discovered that we only need two parts of the red spectrum and three of the blue to grow strawberries in the dark. How cool. You come in in the morning and you have strawberries that grew the night before from the wind power offshore. Isn't that something? The Dutch have discovered this. It's quite amazing. And we look at other examples of integrated thinking, like in a national park in India and in Nepal, where they've saved the tigers by asking the farmers not to cut the firewood near the forest edge and then brings the tigers out to eat the cows. They're letting forage there. And all of a sudden, they, they gave the farmers money from the tourists coming to see the tigers. And all of a sudden they had foreign exchange and they got excited and part of having tigers is to keep the cows close to the farms where you can actually collect the manure and make methane gas. And oh, once you have the methane, you don't need to go forage in the forest for the wood. And so all of a sudden the forests come back, the cows are in a place where you can capture the methane, which is a nice trick. And um, the tigers come back because the farmers have a vested interest in tigers. And all of a sudden these things go into symbiosis and people start making money. So if it's not fossil fuels, what is it? Nuclear with waste? That doesn't sound very clean. If you look at Edison at the end of his life, what did he say? I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. <laughs> Edison, 100 years ago. Isn't that something? And don't forget when Sheikh Yamani founded OPEC in 1973 in London, somebody said, Sheikh Yamani, when do you think we'll see the end of the age of oil? And his response was, all I can say is that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The Oil Age will not end because we run out of oil. Okay? Not all renewable energy is equal. These things are tricky. 
The European Union has asked for 20% renewables by 2020, but guess what they include? Palm oil, biodiesel. Palm oil, biodiesel. So you take rainforests and turn them into this, okay? And you destroy immense tons of carbon that are embedded in a rainforest to, to get something like 10% of the carbon here so you can send this stuff off and burn it somewhere else. These equations are not real. When we look at direct forms of renewables like wind, we see various things that we've experimented with. And, you know, here at Tehachapi, we had, you know, we had derrick towers for a while. That was cute for the raptors because they would roost on them. And then as they took off on the downwind turbines, <laughs> whoops. But now we know how to design wind turbines that are bird happy. But then do we want the turbines in our Nantucket Sound? Well, you know, some people do, some people don't. So the question becomes, maybe we can go offshore. Maine is developing a plan to power the whole state of Maine from offshore wind turbines over the horizon. Isn't that fun? Think about it. It's what the admirals call the 13th mile. It's the thing you can't see. Okay? And it, can they do it? I don't know. It's a moonshot. Can you go to the moon? Well, give them a shot. Give them a chance. You know? It's sort of like that that crazy thing, you know, give the kid a chance. There's a joke about third graders where the teacher comes in and says, okay, today we draw what we love the most. Get out your crayons. Mary, what are you going to draw? I'm going to draw a picture of God. Sorry, Mary, you can't draw a picture of God. Nobody knows what God looks like. I know. That's why I have to draw my picture. <laughs> give the kid a chance. What does it look like? We don't know. For everyone, it's different. In Minnesota, there are friends who are putting together farm co-ops for wind so that all the farmers get to share. Industries like Steelcase have built wind farms to power their production so they can be cradle grail certified. What fun. And I put this in the book for the fun of it. When Romney and Obama were debating during the election and they said we should have indigenous energy in America for energy independence, I agree. They said we should use public lands to get energy in America, I agree. We should drill in Montana. We should build a pipeline from Alberta to Texas. How can they talk about gun control? I'm not kidding. And pipelines with eminent domain. What are they doing? We've done eminent domain. You want rights away for energy independence? We got it. 14,000 miles of Amtrak. Go for it. All the communities along the roadway, the railroad, get out there, put up solar collectors, 80 cents a watt. It's a commodity, people. Let's get on with this thing. It's a beautiful thing to see. Walmart is now the largest user of solar collectors in America. Are they not a business? Excuse me? Knock, knock. See? We will do it as soon as it's cost effective. If we do 14,000 miles of solar collectors, you don't think it'll be cost effective? I mean, scale, right? Velocity, think about it. Free real estate. There it is. We have the rights of way. We have the public territory. We have the federal highway system. The last big eminent domain, Eisenhower, building highways because we were in the Cold War. We were afraid we needed energy, we needed independence from fear for nuclear attacks on our cities. The citizens get out, the military can mobilize. And by the way, we get interstate commerce as a kicker, which was the thing that justified it economically. Fine. Well, we've got all the rights of way. Let's get out and put solar collectors all up and down the fences on solar, on the federal highways. Of course we do. Every community wins. Everybody learns how to do this. They can start solar powering, you know, traffic, I mean, uh, uh, parking lots, and so on and so forth. This is a cute one. We've had this fence facing south. Why wouldn't that be a solar collector? It's on the border with Mexico. What if we sent the Mexicans a signal? Hey, look at this. We can build curtains that are beautiful, and they make power. You can have one, too. <coughs> Welcome to the future. A world of generosity and abundance. Soil, not oil. The, me the point is, when I was born in Japan, as a child, at, at 2 in the morning, the farmers would come through and collect our sewage to take to the farms. And we would wake up because our parents would sing us songs to tell us about the honey wagons coming to collect the night soil. And you're three years old, and it's a poop story, and it's fantastic. Right? And your parents are singing to you. It's so much fun. Poop stories at night. Set to music, even. I mean, it was amazing. Anyway, I always thought that farms in the city were one organism, and I still do. So I'm working in China right now, and we're looking at how to take the phosphate, the nitrogen, the methane from sewage, 
so that we can give it back to the farm as a slow release fertilizer. And the cities now have nutrient factories instead of sewage treatment plants. Of course, because conventional costs us. The taxpayers pay for this stuff and we pollute all the water. So why wouldn't we? This is struvite being collected on the inside of a pipe in Vancouver in a sludge pipe. And the, the guy just put it in a vortex to try and keep it from crystallizing and shrinking his pipes. And he ended up making these little crystals that are business. They're slow release fertilizer, phosphate. And it's 12% return. So think nutrient. Greenhouse effect, what a good idea. What if they were really tiny? Just think about the Netherlands for a second. What's the second largest agricultural exporter in the world by economic terms? A country the size of Maryland. Huh. Why? Intensive agriculture. 2% of the water, so on and so forth. They also have high value production, you know, tulips, tomatoes, whatever. But isn't that amazing? So we can actually be start talking about new technique for growing that uses very little bit of water, that uses the LEDs and so on. I did this drawing of, of Washington, D.C., covered with greenhouses. And a White House official told me it's the first picture he's ever seen of Washington being productive. <laughs> um, but there is no reason our cities can't become food. We can't take gray water and water food with it, right? We can't take those sewage treatment plants, turn them into fertilizer factories, you know? So the whole green roof thing we've been working on all these years is, is manifesting now into cities, you know, covered with farming, of course. Why not imagine Paris um, with farms on the roof? In fact, this person did. He sent me his pictures. Fed his family with rice off his terrace. So let's just take this reduce, reuse, recycle, this minimize, avoid, so on and so forth protocol we have, and let's honor it. Yes, let's be less bad. Absolutely. Good thing. Be efficient. But let's try and do the right thing first, which means we have three new R's for us. Redesign, renew, and regenerate. Right? We need to upcycle design. And the butterfly effect is this, these little acts that people could do as individuals, as organizations, as companies, add up because we are seeing the world as we love it disappearing. The world as we love it, right? Goodbye to the monarchs. Goodbye to the monarchs. Is that the idea? I'm designing a building in Barcelona and the lobby decor is two layers of glass so that instead of putting rainforest trees in there we maintain, you have butterflies hatching on shelves between the two sheets of glass. And you get to watch that as your decoration during the week. These butterflies, the ancient butterflies that are going extinct in Barcelona, hatching inside the wall. And on weekends, the children can come and open the outside window and release the butterflies to Barcelona, which means we engage in a talk with the Parks Department about what they're going to find when they're out there looking for their food. You see, and the birds are looking for the caterpillars. And all of a sudden, the highway verges and they're no longer, oh, weedy, or let's weed whack them or herbicide them to death or something. No, they're all butterfly habitats. Let's get back to work. First job of an architect is to change the way you see. Then we rearrange the furniture. Then we fix the door. <laughs> and then we built. Right? Why couldn't a building restore butterflies? Even the floor tile patterns are butterfly wings. Why not? When I did the River Rouge for Bill Ford, instead of just shrinking it, I mean, this in Dearborn, you know, this is considered a color photograph, really. <laughs> so why would I just shrink the footprint of this industrial facility? So we did this giant project, and when I presented it to the board for approval, I said, you know, this project's for the birds. I had a minute and a half, and I can do math. So I said, you're a $170 billion company, you have 11 board meetings a year, so there's a $150 million decision phase one, so it's worth about a minute and a half. I got that part. So I've used up 20 seconds of my 30, so I'll just finish with this project's for the birds. And that is true. Now, since you're fiduciaries in the car business, let's talk money and cars. So conventional engineering, to do this project and do the, meet the Clean Water Act, and you've already engineered it, it's bid, it's ready to go. Your plan is $48 million. It's three chemical treatment plants and miles of pipe, and workers standing around praying it doesn't rain. You know, seems like stranded assets to me. So this project costs $13 million for the natural system to do the same job. So we're going to save you $35 million in CapEx day one. And with the, with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin coming out of Chicago, this is the equivalent of me walking in here and giving you an order for $900 million worth of cars. Done. Approved. Next.
The language matters. The language of money matters. The right thing to do matters. Leaders like Bill Ford matter. Open the door, do an earth shot, give it a shot. For Make It Right, Brad Pitt and I got together because we were upset after a few years nobody had done anything for the people where the levee broke. They, wouldn't, they couldn't come home. They couldn't navigate the paperwork. It was, they'd lost title, they'd lost family members. It was just awful. So we created a program called Make It Right and we've, we've built, we're building 150 houses based on cradle to cradle materials and thinking of lots of different architects. And the most beautiful story I heard was one mother at the Clinton Goldman Initiative got up and said, you know what happened? I, my daughter always wanted to be able to dance. My son wanted karate lessons. I could never afford them. And then when Katrina came, we had to go to Texas and we lived in a FEMA trailer. And, and finally, we just saw these houses coming and we saw if we could get on board. And, and all the people at Make It Right loved us through it, which is what the assignment I had given the teams. And that's so beautiful that they've remembered that. And she said they loved us through it. And now I live in a house with a $400 mortgage. We each have our own bedroom. The air is really clean. My energy bill is less than $20 a month because I'm solar powered. And, and so now I can afford to give my daughter her dance lessons. And, but the most amazing thing is actually that when we came here from Texas, you know what it's like waking up every morning and say good morning to your daughter and she sounds like this? <laughs> she couldn't breathe. She had been surrounded by formaldehyde for three years. And after four months in our house, not only can I afford to give her dance lessons, she can dance. She can breathe again. Make it right. This matters. Are we here to poison the children? So we've given the Cradle to Cradle protocol at the request of Governor Schwarzenegger to the public in the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, which is here in San Francisco. And we've turned over our whole program into the public domain. So now people can say, I prefer Cradle to Cradle certified products. And what we're looking at is a new way of looking at economics too, because right now we burn fossil fuels. We take, we take, we make, we waste. We deal with things as currency. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Where did it go? To toxify somebody? To lose value? To disappear? To go away? Where is away? Away has gone away. And so what we realize is that eat your apple, you've got currency. You ate it, it's here, it's gone. It's current. The term actually betrays its contemporary nature. So the issue is what happened to the orchards? The orchards are our capital. So if we put solar collectors along Amtrak, Amtrak produces power for us cleanly every year, like an orchard of joy and benefit, and the jobs will be immense. So let us reimagine our economy for a few minutes as currency becomes aggregated with solar income, gets aggregated with the living soil, so our technology and our biology are coherent. <coughs> CO2 goes from the atmosphere to soil, and we develop capital that creates recurrency. Why wouldn't we have recurrency? Why wouldn't we recapitalize? Why wouldn't we start over? And so instead of just worrying about economy, equity, and ecology and triple bottom line thinking, whatever's left over, why don't we generate revenue? What about triple top line thinking? You see, these are executives here. I'm not sure in the accounting program, right? So the upcycle chart helps us because it's about continuous improvement and humility. We are constantly changing. So we had to develop a certification that certifies human intention. Because if all we do is certify what you did yesterday, well, how are you going to go forward for tomorrow? So it actually certifies you and you have to get recertified, which means you've improved, you see. Of course we have to do that. So yes, think globally, act globally, but perhaps locally, but actually perhaps we should expand that. What if we thought galactically and acted molecularly? And asked ourselves, what is next? And what would it mean to have endless resourcefulness instead of a world of limits? Because all our materials are coherently designed for reuse cycles, not end of life. These, your toaster is not a living thing. You know, if you're talking about life cycle of a toaster, you must be kidding me. Anyway, these are use periods of these materials, you see. They're not alive, but we're not leaving. We're going to be native to this place. What does it mean to be designing to be native to this place? The DOE had a conference at the Hanford nuclear plant. 
and they brought designers and semiologists, sign designers and scientists to design a sign, I'm not kidding, so that where they stored the plutonium from our bombs and missiles, so that even an extraterrestrial, 5,000 years from now, would not dare to dig. What is the sign of the extreme danger of humans? And the Yakima bumped into the scientist at the Pacific National Lab during lunch, and they started laughing when they heard this. And they said, you know what? You really don't need to worry about this. When they land, we'll tell them where it is. They weren't leaving. These are native people. How many of you are planning to leave the earth? No. no. Are you native? Are you indigenous people? To this planet? Well, let's get on with it. So, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Perhaps we need to glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's greenings, and think again. Perhaps we need a bit of a revolution. Perhaps we need regenerates to lead it. Thank you very much. Yes, we do. In fact, that's a great question. The bookseller is right there. And I'm going to sign books. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's a nice question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, I, I was wondering if you could just speak about the uh, business model of planned obsolescence and uh, where you see that going in the future. Did somebody set you up? No, you couldn't have asked a better question. Um, see, planned obsolescence, you know, as it's tra traditionally um, conceived was something after Second World War to keep the economy churning. And the idea, even the color marketing group was formed for that purpose so they could have the style, the color of the year, you know, it's avocado this year, the pink is out of style, you got to get a new one, right? To keep the whole consumer society moving. So for us, we would like to see planned obsolescence. I think that's a really great idea. So, but I'd like to see the planning be real planning, not just to talk about consumer products and every year. So I think there are three kinds of products. There's the one, there's the product you need, the product you want, and the product you love. So think of a car. You need a zip car from here to there. You need a little car to commute with, whatever. That's the car you need. The car you want is BMW or whatever it is, right? Um, and the car you love is the antique Mercedes Roadster that's in your garage and you bring out on the weekends, right? So there's durability for some temp contemporary for others. Your cell phone, you want it to be service. And if I said to you, you know, I'm going to design this to be durable so you can have the cell phone for 25 years, you're going to look at me like a hound dog reading an algebra book, right? Like, what am I talking about? So I would love the cell phone to have planned obsolescence. So the idea would be, when you finish with this, within the next few years, that it's designed to become another one and never see the biosphere, see? It becomes a technical nutrient system. And when we say these computers and stuff, we can't recycle them because now we're gluing them together and so on so they don't come apart. That's idiotic. If you can make something go together, you can make it come apart. So we've looked at glues that, that shrink at high temperatures. So you just take the computers, stick them through an oven, <laughs> they fall apart, all the parts are there, and you disassemble and go back to work, you see? So these are problems to solve, not barriers to human imagination, right? So there's that. So that kind of planning. The other would be certain things you want and you might want to own, I guess for psychological reasons, because how many of you own your house, really? You know, you have a bank involved, right? Cars are leased, you know. Do you really want to own the washing machine? How about your television set, 4,360 chemicals? Really? You want to own that, right? What you want to do is watch TV. You know? So there's other business models for that, which would be a kind of leasing concepts and stuff we've been talking about for many years. So there's that, carpets. You don't need to own the carpet. You can have it as a service, and it can be stored, like we've done for Shaw Industries, which part of Berkshire Hathaway. It's stored on the customer's floors. How good. We have 1.4 billion pounds of carpet in America, carpet waste every year, 1.4 billion pounds. The last textile industry in America left. Why? Because it's heavy, and they can't ship it to us from China. It's too expensive to ship. So well, what if we stored all our carpet on the floors of the customers, and it's all designed safely, not PVC, recycling toxins, you know, like some of the car carpet companies who have zero goals. Probably just as well. We hope they 
get there. Um, but it's material, it's nutrients that are on your customer's floor. So all of a sudden you have a relationship with the customer, which is ideal because when they want to change it, you're the best person to do it because you have a truck coming with a new one and you take back the old one and it's your materials, you see? Beautiful. So now that's a kind of material passport system. We've even found in design of buildings, we design for planned obsolescence. I designed the GAPS corporate campus, now YouTube's headquarters. We designed it. We designed all those office buildings to be apartment buildings in the future. So if the market changes, turn it into apartment buildings. You have the embodied energy, the materials, everything becomes another use. It's designed into it. It's planned obsolescence as an office building, you see? Designed, and it, so ideally you'd release it as an office because it's cheap, it's the best economics or you convert it to another thing because the market moves that way. But even then, we can also, with our, our tools now, we can embody attributes in our drawings of all the materials. We have discovered that if we, we used to just say it's steel or concrete, depending on the market, because they're usually always very close, because it's the market. And we'd go concrete, steel, concrete, steel. And now what we've realized is if you track commodity value of steel for the last 15 years, 10% rise per year, okay? And then you think, wait a minute, if I build a concrete, it goes to aggregate. So in 15 years, if it gets demolished and it has to be used for something else, that's now, you know, road fill, you know? And yet the steel is going up in value. So if I know where everything is and I know what the value is, it turns out to be 1.8% increase on the pro forma, the financing of the building, first instance. Amazing. See, that's business talking. Planned obsolescence. Material passports. Leasing concepts. So, this idea of a consumer society, you cannot consume your toaster, okay? You can use it. So we see consumer products are things that go back to soil or water, like paper. Um, electronics and things like that are customer products. They're products of service. You want the service of these materials, not their ownership, and they can't go back to the soil or the water. See? So we saw, we saw those as service products. And we see the other consumables have to be safe and healthy. And then you get weird stuff. How's that for planned obsolescence? Nature's organic raspberries. Gluten-free, raw, vegan. USDA organic. Nice. This pouch that they're in weighs a little more than the product itself. I see no sign on the back that says what I meant to do with this. There's no little triangle with a funny number. You don't know what it means. Nothing. A package weighs more than the product. This is seven layers of polymer. One is for the finish. One is to receive the inks. One is for oxygen. One is for water, etc. Monstrous hybrid. What is meant to happen to this? This can go nowhere but a landfill or an incinerator. And I'll bet you, certainly with this color, which probably has chlorine in it, right? You don't want to breathe the smoke that comes off this baby, right? How about that? Like organic. Gluten, I mean, please, right? How about let's sell healthy food in a very unhealthy world, right? So planned obsolescence, where's the plan? Where's the obsolescence, right? They're planning the obsolescence of the human species. Zero would be a good idea. the answer you're worried about. Exactly. <laughs> Can you tell us some of the projects you're doing in the Bay Area with Google and other people? Well, we have projects here. We're working with Recology on all their work. Um, with Google, we do strategic planning and materials assessment um, strategy work. Um, I think the projects that are most interesting right now, we're working with Chinese to develop new transfer of technologies, the you know, cradle to cradle technologies for the two countries to share um, that do things like, you know, make everything into nutrients. There's that. Um, the, the project I'm most focused on right at the moment, because today is a project I'm doing in India, where we, uh, I'm designing a factory, and we're doing eight things on the roof. Um, so the factory itself is a motorcycle factory, but we found a way to make electricity, uh, from renewables. We make electricity, heating, cooling, oxygen, carbon dioxide, food, jobs, and water. Um, it's a desert climate. We make water out of the air. Um, we're doing eight things on the roof that benefit 
the environment, society, and provide jobs while we're busy inside an empty building. And little things that were fun, like we found that we need four air changes an hour by code. We said, why? Well, it's because of you know, oxygen for the workers. So we said, what if we make oxygen in the building with plants? And um, we remove 70% of the heating and cooling load. Pays for itself in six months. And we give oxygen and air purification to all the workers. Beautiful thing, and it's a residue of all the other systems. So once you put yourself in this frame of mind, you discover these immense economies. That's the most valuable thing we're doing, I think, is the economic model. Because if we don't have that, you know, we don't get people out of their chairs in the morning. <laughs>